We'll have to get Jay to crash one of these sessions. Oh, yeah, I know, right? Jay's a busy man. All righty, y'all want to get started? Let's do it. Let's do it. So I'll give my little rundown, and uh, then we can read through it and talk through it. This is already our sixth one, guys. Y'all, y'all realize that? It, Six already? Yeah, it would be seven. I'm sorry I missed last week, everybody. I feel awful about that. Are you feeling better? Yeah, I feel a lot better. I was, I was really anxious, and so I took a uh, Klonopin that I'm prescribed for the first time in like probably almost a year. And so, you know, I didn't intend to pass out, but, like, next thing I knew, I woke up, it was 8.30, and I was like, oh, shit. Oh, my God. But, yeah, sorry about that, y'all. No worries. So, yeah, uh, we're looking at First John 3, 1 through 10. And this is my kind of my little take on it real quick. Um, the author is reiterating that we are the children of God, and... You know, we see this theme coming over and over again, describing what it, what it looks like to be a child of God so you can identify a child of God versus, um, you know, uses a few different terms like antichrist or false prophet, stuff like that. Um, and the author, the author says, uh, if you are God's child, if you are living in light and in love, you can see when others are doing the same. So if someone is living in darkness, they can't distinguish one thing from the next. They're blind, and they can't see that you are practicing a life of light and a life of love. So it kind of takes one to know one sort of thing with living in the light. You remember that DC talk? I want to be in the light. Yes. As you are in the light. <laughs> uh, That's and the soundtrack for tonight. Hell yeah. <laughs> Put that as outro music. Um, and then the author seems to, the, he goes on a, a little rant here. He seems to believe, you know, that the second coming, uh, will happen within his lifetime. You know, in, we assume in a literal sense, m most of the New Testament authors kind of assumed that, uh, Christ was coming back in their lifetime. Um, but I think it's kind of cool to look at it metaphorically, you know, like looking at the end times as your end times, as the end of your life, you know. And and uh, kind of seeing it like that, making it, making it personal, and it, it is almost a way to to reclaim it literally too. You know, like looking at the apocalypse, like we have multiple apocalypses, multiple end times, multiple antichrists, and things like that. So anyway, so he, maybe multiple second comings even. Um, so the author seems to believe the second coming is in, in his lifetime, like everybody else. Um, but then he he does go on to make the point that by living in light and in love and by participating in Christ in the event of the kingdom in Caputo's language uh, we will be working towards behaving and appearing identical to Christ which is a really exciting really poetic huge idea He's, he, he says we don't know what the returning Christ will look like but if we emulate him we will look just like him and that's this really magnificent kind of uh, imagery. Um, and, uh, you know, living in the light is a practice, and an activity, an event that we have to devote ourselves uh, to, to in order um, to make internal progress and to love each other more and to be more like Christ. We have to practice it. We have to, you know, it's, it's a never-ending thing. We, there's, there's no end-all, be-all. Um, and it, it's, and, and being like Christ, working towards practicing being like Christ is a powerful and emotional ideal to work, to kind of work towards and to choose to emulate this kind of perfect celestial resurrected and returned son of man. You know, it's just, it, I really like, um, the author's language there about that. It's, you know, playing into this kind of mythology mythology doesn't necessarily mean something's false but you know this 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 legendary language mythological language of the, of the returning celestial king you know it's this very poetic language and then he goes on to talk about if you know god you won't sin and so for me personally this part of the letter was very triggering because the way that i read it growing up was um you know 
I, and I was, I was, it was triggering for me because I was raised in a ridiculously works and performance based spiritual environment. And their idea of if you're a real Christian, if you're really saved, if you're really going to avoid your deserved consequence of eternal torture, your status of being saved or chosen, or, or the Calvinist term being the elect, then you'll stop messing up and you'll live a perfect life, a sinless life. And, and I think that that's a toxic idea. Saying you know if you're if you're a real Christian you'll stop sinning you know you know why you know why are you sinning you you if you're a real Christian so I think we have to kind of re look at that term sin I think in our first or second meeting we, we we did that a little bit but maybe looking at looking at this idea as um, you know I I know I would like to look at it a little bit differently and un unload some of my baggage around it I obviously have a lot of baggage around it that I'm dragging around. I'd like to at least lighten it, lighten some of that baggage a little bit, but maybe by by rereading it as um, keeping on sinning, it uses the phrase you know you you will keep on sinning. Uh, maybe seeing that as intentionally hurting others for selfish, hateful reasons. If you keep on doing that, you know they're just you know when you meet someone who's just like kind of shady and slimy, and you kind of always kind of gotta keep an eye on them and you know you never know what they're up to they're they're living in darkness they're they're very deceptive first john talks a lot about honesty versus deception and um so you know maybe keeping on sinning is, is this idea of still living uh in in dishonesty and in darkness um and and being you know hurt, hurtful to others and to yourself um and you know this letter is all about honesty and being in the light and so i think that that kind of fits it well um, so, you know, going on lying all the time, being dishonest, um, hurting yourself and hurting others uh, as a motivation, not at not as a motivation of getting a bad grade on some sky man's test. You know, I sinned. You know, I, I, I got a bad grade on, on God's test. I, I answered wrong. Um, not looking at it as like losing points or disappointing um, you know, some rule-loving tyrant, but just living, you know, stumbling around um, in a pitch in a pitch black room, you know, hurting yourselves and others, living in darkness, not because God told you not to, but because it's not a good way to live, stumbling around in darkness, running into shit, and hurting people and yourself. Um, and then I. Uh, what do I mean by this note here? Language, uh, can, you can't keep on, oh, the language of you can't keep on sinning because you're children of God. Kind of almost reclaiming that from the Calvinist perspective and saying like, almost kind of flipping it on that perspective of predestination and saying, well, then I have nothing to worry about because I can't sin. It says, you know, if you're if you're in Christ, you can't sin. Oh, good. I can't sin. I can't mess up. You thought you saw me mess up and sin the other day? You're wrong. You must be wrong. I can't. I can't do it. I mean, according to the Bible, I'm incapable. You know, uh, you, you must have been wrong about that one. I, um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a silly idea, but, but this, the idea of you, you can't, um, I guess, live in darkness if you're living in light is, is a kind of nice, simple, logical way to break that down. Um, so yeah, that's my kind of analysis of it. And then, if you want to do a quick little read through, this is a quick ten verses. Um, someone wants to take First John three, one through. Let's do one through three. Tell us what version you're reading, please. I can read. It's uh, NRSV is what I'm reading from. All right, Harley. Uh, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it, it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, and all who have this hope in him purify themselves as he is pure. Mm. Nice. And we want to take four through seven. I'll do it. Thank you, John. Um, this is the New Jerusalem version, so 
1 John 3, 4, whoever sins acts wickedly because all sin is wickedness. Now you are well aware that he has appeared in order to take sins away and that in him there is no sin. That's interesting. Um, no one who remains in him sins and whoever sins has neither seen him nor recognized him. Uh, children do not let anyone lead you astray. Whoever acts uprightly is upright, just as he is upright. That's verse 7. How far do you want me to go? Yeah, 7. And then just if anyone wants to finish off 8 through 10. Okay. Or you can just finish it off, Josh, if you want. <laughs> I have no problem. Um, whoever lives sinfully belongs to the devil. And since the devil has been a sinner from the beginning, this was the purpose of the appearing of the Son of God. And unto the work of the devil, no one who is a child of God sins because God's seed remains in him, nor can he sin because he is a child of God. And this is what distinguishes the children of God from the children of the devil. Whoever does not live uprightly and does not love his brother is not from God. Nice. It's pretty preachy there at the end. Yeah, oh, of course. I think it's really interesting that it says in... Um, now you are well aware that he has appeared in order to take away sin, verse 5. Mm -hmm. And that in him in there him is, is no, no, sin. no sin. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of takes away um, original sin. To take away sins. So if we're, if we're looking at sins not as like actions of like bad deeds that you've done because we know that can't be true because every like it says once you're a christian you stop sinning well you don't stop doing bad things that's just a fact so if if uh if sinning is maybe you know hurting yourself and hurting others maybe i, I don't know i just I, maybe we can come to a consensus definition of what what he means in this letter by sinning because i i don't think that he could literally mean you know, just doing a a bad deed or, or or breaking a commandment because that that's you know literally impossible. Yeah, it's it's it seems strange to me that this sort of language would be here, especially when like in Romans, Paul says all of us have sinned and fall short of the, the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And then here here it basically says, but if you're a Christian, don't worry about it. Right. You know, that seems strange to me. It doesn't, it doesn't seem coherent. And it, it kind of seems like a, that German proverb that says, if you want to be my brother, that's great. But if you don't believe what I believe, I'll bash your head in. Um, it sort of be like, well, as long as you live just like me, we're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. but other, other than that, you're kind of screwed. Um, and it also kind of seems like, well, if you know, you know. Like that early part where he says, well... Christian, let's see. Actually, everyone else talk. I'm going to try to find that part. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really, really common evangelical way to read it, and it's hard to divorce myself from reading it like that. And I'm, I've been trying throughout this tree to as, like, being in the light versus being in the darkness instead of, like, being in our club versus not being in our club. You know, trying to take the uh, exclusivism element out of out of it um hopefully it was never there to start with and we were just given a, a version of reading it maybe it is there essentially though i i don't you know i don't know i don't have a completely objective filter so it's uh it's so it's a verse six when it says um no one who remains in him sins and whoever sins has neither seen him nor re recognized him and it's like well you already be perfect if you do jesus but if you don't know Jesus, that's that guy, and we're gonna stone him. You know, it just—it just seems pretty convenient to be like, "Oh, I'm perfect." That guy right there. Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, I look at it. You know, I look at it uh, within the realm of the theme of this letter, which is this division within a church, and you, we have uh, uh, folks who are giving a different message than what the author of this book is giving. And if you look in verse four, I'm reading from the, the common English Bible uh, version. And it says, every person who practices sin commits an act of rebellion and sin is rebellion. And you know that he appears to take away sin and there is no sin in him. And, and it is kind of odd because, you know, all of Jesus's mission was an act of rebellion against the established uh, 
church within Israel. Um, they, he was turning everything on top of his head because, and then when you read that, that just goes in conflict. If you're looking at that larger theme of Jesus's ministry, but if you look down within the theme of this book and it's, and it's about this uh, internal struggle within a congregation, then you kind of see, it's like, okay, well, his side is not rebelling. So, you know, and, and Jesus is on his side is what he is arguing here. And so I'm wondering if it's a smaller uh, audience that this uh, message is really towards and not really a larger audience that we usually apply it to. Right. Oh, for sure. This is like a, this is like an internal email in a company, you know, um, this is meant like a what? to what I'm sorry. Say it again. An internal email in a company. So oh, yes. this is meant to be sent to a small number of people, not meant to be broadcast for me or any of us to hear in a different language. This was, I mean, this was like our Facebook back page where we're gossiping about Karen because she got her head too big this week. Um, and we need to make sure that we're on the same page. And the language you would use in that sort of text is the language you would use here. It seems very petty. It seems very uh, derogatory being like, well, obviously me and you are best friends. We know what's up. Um, and that's why they're talking in these veiled terms of being like sinless because they agree that the two of them are sinless, but everyone else is sketchy and subject. But to try to use it, you know, in a bigger context, which the church has used over the years of being a letter that is authoritative for everyone, it's silly. Mm -hmm. um, at least unless you don't look at it in the, that context. Oh, yeah. To say this applies to everybody. But just like, this was very and big audience. And we do it in justice to say, well, this is for everybody and everyone can understand it. That's not, I don't think that's true. And I think it's hard because um, if someone read my personal emails between me and my boss and they read them this way, it'd be pretty messed up about how you'd, how you'd come down on that side or either side. Mm. Hey guys, we're going to get kicked off, so I'm, I'm going to right now end this and start a new one. It's the exact same number, so let's all, let's all just restart real quick, okay? Okay. Alright, here you go. That's everyone, right? Before we closed up, Zoe had his hand up, had your hand up, so what were you? Oh, um... I just, I have a, a question. Can we, can we get a little bit churchy for a second? Sure. Okay. I have an uncomfortable feeling. Okay. May I describe it? Please. Sure. Okay. I, um, once upon a time, was a part of a lot of Bible studies. And we uh, would have different kinds of Bible studies. And some of the Bible studies I was part of, there was like a leader of the Bible study. And from time to time, a, uh, uh, like a guest speaker would show up. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that what's going on here? I'm just, I'm trying to just trying to, to figure that out. Cause if that's what's going on here, I wasn't aware. Oh. And no, yeah. Josh. Josh was a guest speaker uh, in the past. Okay, but now he's just joined the study. Oh, he's part of the study now. Yeah. Okay, I see. I guess. Okay. Okay. Wow. My, I'm just, I'm just not connecting with the way that you guys are, are, uh, are in this verse at all. But I will keep trying. Well, what's, what's your? <laughs> Well, yeah, do you want to express your <laughs> like, What do you I've think? Lost your man? audio. Are you still there, Zoe? Well, I, I can say something about um, what sort of what I'm hearing about. So I'm just going to listen some more. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm going to listen some more. I think I think it's the I think it's the idea that there's. A way to 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 interpret the verse. That's the, like like I, I think that might be part of it. But um, I'm somebody else, please. <laughs> you don't want to share what you think? Yeah, I'm really interested in that. 
I'm in a hypervigilant state tonight, having a hard time getting a Bible study. I'm doing my best. I just needed to come in and ask that question and clarify. And I'm just having a rough time tonight. I, it's, yeah, that it's nobody's fault. <laughs> I'm choosing to be here. I gotta go again, but I'm still here. Fair, fair. fair. Thank, well, thank you, you for asking. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think any of us are saying that we have the right answer on this verse. I mean, we're trying to approach it. We've we're sharing our past experiences and how uh, the verse has been interpreted to us. And at the same time, we're trying to look at all the different nuances that we may have not looked at before in the past and trying to understand the message within it. Um, so, you know, it's not saying that we're right. It's not saying that we're wrong. It's just saying that we're, we're all in this uh, this journey together and we're trying to find the nuggets within it that has kept it alive all this time. I mean, you know, there's a reason why they thought it was important enough to put within the Bible, you know? And so we look at other people's uh, interpretations of it and commentaries on it. And then we try to come up with, you know, what best, how, how that helps us within our lives and in our daily living as well and better understanding you know, what our relationship is with the world or with God or whatever. So, you know, that's, that's kind of really what we're all doing. We're not saying anybody's right, not saying anybody's wrong. We're just trying to uh, just travel together. I agree. So, so I can, I can give a take then that's uh, a yes. different, different ballpark than oh, this. Yes. Please. Please. Yes. I, think, I think I have a different one too. I mean, Do it. I think, right. please. What, I'm, what I'm reading here is a whole bunch of othering. That's what I'm reading. <laughs> I'm seeing a whole bunch of othering. It's a whole bunch of people that are his and people that are not his. And that's what I'm reading when I read this. And I mean, like, I see a few places in here where I'm like, I suppose there's some good something in there I can apply. I mean, and this is honestly one of my favorite books of the Bible. And I'm still reading this going, that's, I don't know how to redeem that. Mm. That's it. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> total misconception right here. I thought you were trying to shit on us because we were being too liberal um, and that we were not taking it seriously. And no, fuck not. Having, no. That, having that perspective that you just said is so, yeah. is so refreshing and so... Who's, ta- who's talking? I'm Josh. Hey. Josh. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not trying to shit on anybody at all. I'm saying, I'm saying this is scary. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Because it, it, I was actually going to bring that up earlier. It, it seems like he's saying, if you don't agree with me, well, you're part of the devil and you're going to hell. Because there's a part right here that says, whoever lives sinfully belongs to the devil. This is verse 8. And since the devil has been a sinner from the beginning, period. That's it. There's no other thing there. There's nothing qualifying. It just is like, you're bad and we're going to fight you. And <laughs> like, I don't want to fight anyone. I just want to understand. That's funny. So I feel like like it's just been context that we've been talking about, about the context behind the letter and, you know, what they were, what was going on and what they were talking about. But, like, I just want to throw this out there as a feminazi. Like, it's always interesting to me, like reading this stuff because it's men that wrote a lot of this stuff. Oh yeah, and by men, that it, it always feels like a kissing contest. Oh, for sure. Um, because men are like that, and I've noticed that you know in the church, like that's a common theme where men are in leadership, and there's always some kind of like, mm, my dick's bigger than yours, almost. I'm sorry, I'm not very. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm kind of crude, but um, but that that's what this makes me think of when there's a lot of othering that happens. It kind of makes me think of that. It feels very patriarchal. It feels very hierarchical. Like there's always a power dynamic there um, to some degree. And to me, what I glean from it is human nature is kind of the same Mm. then as it is now. And church church power structures are kind of similar now the way that they were then yeah even with a brand new church (laughs) right right and so what are we you know what are we looking at now and how do we kind of deconstruct that and recognize like okay we're just as human now as they were then 
and mm. do we other like that like are we still doing that mm. like that's what i'm thinking of that's good selena thank you thank you any opportunity to redeem shit like this is really helpful <laughs> that Absolutely. was great thank you <laughs> thank you um another uh, something i was hearing um earlier was about talk about the word sin which i find really helpful um that's one of the word one of a uh, number of words that's really helpful to look at again it's a word that i i have aversion to i don't like it yeah. it doesn't i don't um my understanding of it from growing up just doesn't work with um, yeah. with how i think now and i i I like how we've talked, um, we've talked about it before, but um, too, other ideas of how sin could be looked at. And um, an, an idea that I've been bouncing around about sin is um, the, like thinking of it as, um, or acting as though you're separate or you're in isolation and that you're cut off from everyone else when um, we're all in this together. And I feel like one way to look at sin is, is when you, when you don't see that and you don't have a sense of that and you go out in the world and you, and you, and you're living as though you're isolated and you're separate from others when you're, um, when, when you're not. And that's, that's just another idea I have of sin that's mm. been floating around in my mind. Cool. I love that. I think, I think Caleb, when you opened up about how triggering the chapter is or the section of it is, um, yeah, I mean, we're all kind of reacting to, well, it's, do I fall in the other category or do I fall in the in category? If I fall in the in category, am I good or am I just as fucked up as these guys are mm. back in the day or this group is? Um, and I, I think from a, I was trying to think of some themes and I haven't been in the study in a while. And so I, I, I'm trying to keep up with kind of where we're at with it. But if it's, if, if John was the writer of the gospel of John and John wasn't written to like, necessarily evangelized but the church was already relatively established it was kind of a worshipful text it used a lot of like poetic language then and if john includes this the section about there's no con uh oh no i'm thinking of paul with the no condemnation in christ like this i think the common misconception at least what i struggle with is someone's in christ or someone's not in christ mm. and then there's this division between two groups of people um and my question in the last like 10 years has been who, who isn't in Christ? Like, how is, how can you possibly not be if Christ redeemed the whole thing, the whole cosmos kind of universal Christ concept? Like if that's true, then from that place, anytime talking about darkness, it says in verse four, maybe, where is it? Jesus came to destroy the devil somewhere in there. Where is it? Verse eight. The son of God was revealed for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. If John has an understanding that the devil is the accuser, then to me, it's like sin is, is any kind of like any kind of accusation, like you or condemnation is a better word, maybe like, so if it's read that way, then if you're living as if you've been condemned and there's no hope for you, then you're living in this kind of like old sin, sin context or construct. And I don't know. That's a whole lot at one time, but I'm trying to read things like abide. And you mentioned like the theme of honesty. I'm trying to read redeem the idea of like, like devil is always a triggering word for me because I've been told like I'm the devil and my brother, yes. I influence yeah. my brothers to the devil because I listen to metal music and shit. But in the biblical concept, it's just being accused. Uh -huh. So if Christ says you're no longer accused, you can live as if you're not accused anymore. The whole thing's been redeemed. Then, this becomes not maybe not a great text, <laughs> but there's some elements in it that may be useful. I don't know. Does that make sense? Does anybody res does that resonate at all? For sure. It's it seems like if you have a universal Christ who's taking care of all sins, the only caveat is, but you have to believe sounds exclusionatory and ridiculous, and it sounds like a mystery cult that just needs to get more members to get more money to make their churches bigger. Um, right. But if if the act already happened, then it doesn't matter if you believe or not, right? Because right. it, it's already been had. It seems if if God really were that arbitrary to be like, yeah, but if you don't know the story, well, well you're out. That 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 God seems like mm -hmm. a douchebag, and yeah. that that's your douchebag uncle is trying to sell thirteen year olds crack. Like that is that's not a good story. I don't hear that. 
I just want I just want the yeah. good stuff that you already told me. Mm. You can't have all these caveats. It just doesn't seem it doesn't seem believable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's confusing to me that this letter can use such exclusivist language, you know, us versus them type stuff that we're taking away from it, and then turn around and in the next chapter, you know, and spoiler alert, I guess, since we haven't gotten here yet, but in chapter four, it says, you know, um, let us love one another. Love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And anyone who loves knows this is God. This high school Bible. Anyone. I should have been condemned for this. I should have been put in a loony bin. Look at all these crazy notes. <laughs> they should have been like, this kid has a problem. You do their hearing voices, or I don't know. But everyone was like, no, nah, he's a good student. Let's figure it out. Hey, all. Um, it seems like my nervous system is a little bit Bible allergic today. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean I don't love y'all. And I'll see you again. But I need to go scratch my itches. Love you, Zo. Goodbye, Zo. Love to see you. Really we'll good you next time. You, All right, love you, Zo. It's good seeing you. Hope you feel better soon. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's interesting because this can be such an inclusive book, and yet it seems it can also be so othering sometimes. I guess it's just it's like humans, you know. It's confusing. It's it's contradictory, just like humans are. What if it's not about people? I mean, what? I mean, obviously they're using the language of it's like if you, right? But but what if like if accusation and othering and and divisiveness is of the devil, then unity and kindness and like and not not in a, like a weak way, right? I mean, Selena brought up like the patriarchal like element of the text, which is totally there because it's all hymns and you know whatnot, but. Can it can it can it live outside of it having to be about you know Bill versus Sue or whatever you know like and if it does that can can it be um, can it be better? Hmm. By the way, I have no stake in like making the Bible awesome. I could really give two shits like, but I think there's there's ways to read it that aren't uh, that don't have to come down on. So. I have a question that I do not have an answer to. When was the New Testament canon set? Hmm. Go, every, everyone I'm Google it and figure it out. Four fifty. I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess. Council of something. Or other. There were several councils. So the Second Council of Tertullian in six ninety two was one. The. Uh, uh-huh. Catholic Church provided a considered definition of the biblical canon in 13, or 382. The Council of Rome in 1545 and the reaffirming councils of Florence in 1442. The North African Councils of Hippo and Carthage in 419. The Church of England and the 39 Articles of Faith was 1563. And the Westminster Confession was 1647. That's not that long ago. Mm. Yeah. But, I mean, it's all over the place. So we didn't have the Bible we have now until like three or four hundred years ago. But every church talks about it like it's Mm -hmm. been there since when Jesus was talking. When he was walking around in AD 30, they were like, we already got this stuff down. Yeah, there was no transcription, right? (laughs) No. Everyone assumes that the Bible was you know, facsimile from heaven to us that no one wrote it, which is clearly not true. Um, And there are documents that have been deemed sacred for reasons that might not be sacred. I'm not saying they're, they're bad. I mean, I, I I love the Bible. Um, I've read it many times. And as Caleb can attest, I call myself a Christian atheist because the Bible means so much to me and the Christian story means so much to me, but taking a serious hard look at the books we have doesn't necessarily bode in the favor of the actual canon. To me, I think we need to let it say what it says. I'm not a big fan of people making the Bible 
sound nice and sugarcoat it. I really don't like that when people do that. Mm -hmm. Let it say what it says and allow the context and be aware of the history. Because again, I feel like it's not meant to be taken literally anyway. Like it's not, the whole point of it is not to be, uh, you know, like we were told growing up, like, oh, this is a roadmap for life, you know, or right. this is an instruction manual for life. No, it's not. Right. Right. It's not, it's not, it's, it's, you know, stuff that was written by other people. And like, just, I, I want it to say what it says. I want to know, you know, the context. I want to know the history. And I find it interesting. Yeah. Me too. too. And that's, it's that simple. Part, it's it's yeah. that simple. That's part of what I can't get over it. So all of the books in the Bible, with the exception of Hebrews, were written by men. Hebrews is, is contested. It could have been written by a woman, but okay. they're not. But no one is sure. Um, so other than that, the Bible is 100% men, um, which I'm sure seems a little shitty to any woman who's reading it. Um, to get that perspective, right? So can you speak a little more to that? I'd love that. <laughs> really? Do you really want me to? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> we're, gonna be, we're gonna be here all night. Um <laughs> oh, Selena. <laughs> I'm from the south and I'm a preacher's daughter. I can go all night, you guys. And I just had a nice alcoholic beverage. Um no, I, you know, it's funny because it didn't really occur to me how little, like how few books in the Bible were written by women um, growing Maybe up. Maybe one. I know. Yeah. Growing up, like it just never occurred to me. You know, there's stories where there's like female characters and stuff, but again, nothing really written by women and kind of coming to terms with that as a woman, as an adult who I was subscribing to, you know, Christianity, I had to have a really hard look at it and say, how much of this is affected by a male perspective? And how much of this really translates for me and my experience with a higher power, you know, and um, it was a very hard realization. Like, it was very hard for me to say, you know what, this is why I've always kind of struggled to connect with a lot of the texts. Um, and so honestly, I went out of my way to seek more um, female figures that were spiritual or Christian that, you know, actually, you know, wrote their own, you know, books and stuff. I mean, I, I'm kind of like embarrassed to say, but like Beth Moore, I used to be a really big fan of Beth Moore. Um, she, you know, I think is like Baptist or something. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, there's like Joyce Meyer and shit. But like, I just, I started to go out of my way and look for women that were sharing their uh, perspective and experience on their higher power and God and their relationship with God. So, you know, it's kind of crazy because it's like, well, you would think, you know, the Bible, like that's the main text for Christianity, that that would be, you know, like the the all encompassing, you know, text, but it's really not. It's very male centric. It's very patriarchal. The perspective again, is just so dude, dude, dude. Like when I read it, I'm like, man, this is such a dude thing to say. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I don't don't know how else to put it, you know? So I love um, that you, you mentioned like the history and looking at the history. And I hope you don't take, I hope that nobody takes like me trying to look from a mystical perspective as like a, trying to make it pretty that's not the goal but like to see if maybe there was a different perspective on john's side um right and i, I would i would say too like as a point of hopeful hope, hope maybe there's been great efforts in the last say like 10 or 15 years to do like decolonization perspective of the yeah. bible and then yeah. woman like they call it womanist perspective which i think is probably an outdated term but there's mm-hmm. like a whole bible that's the whole commentary within it is from a uh looking at it from a gender perspective gender right. studies perspective and I think, I don't know if there was any books being published or letters going out by women in 300 AD historically. I don't know if there was a ton of that happening. Well, um, it's interesting because there were female apostles. There were right. female disciples. 
There were women that had house churches in the early church. There was a lot of them and there was a lot of female followers of Christ, but it's just not really talked about. And when it's actually, you know, you research it and you look more into it, it's incredible. And it's such a disservice to me to 50% of the fucking church to not for churches, not really to even discuss that, to not even talk about it. Um, I found a lot of hope in like the Eastern traditions too, right? Like, cause they, they have women yeah. saints and have had for hundreds and hundreds of years. And yeah. there's this like allowance, not allowance, but like a promotion of that in a way that I didn't get in a Pentecostal church at all. There was no, my, and my pastor was a woman and she didn't, you know, she gave mm-hmm. into a lot of patriarchal language consistently. Um, and it was right. upsetting because there was no, I was just assumed the way it was. I'm sorry. I may have cut you off, Josh. I apologize. No, no, not at all. I was just going to say, who's heard of Thecla? Nobody. There's actually a book called the, the, I don't think it's the gospel, but it's the, the works of Paul and Thecla. And there's actually like in Turkey, like I've, I've been there. There's a statue of Thecla who was a female disciple or apostle who was one of Paul's like students. Um, and she, she actually is like, mm. is said to have stood off against a lion in the, uh, in the agora so like the lions wouldn't uh, wouldn't attack her because they were female lions they wouldn't attack a female and she kept preaching and doing all this crazy awesome stuff. and she was i mean yes the gospel is a little um what is it um uh neat or something you'd say like that it, it's not it wasn't highly publicized but there are statues of her like how could there be statues of this woman if she didn't matter in the early church like right. why would they make that like that's that's a big deal because they didn't even make statues of peter until right. yeah so like right. in the first second century if they're making statues of this woman thecla she must have meant something to the early church so i think it, i think if you look up the acts of paul and thecla like that's where the whole myth of uh paul taking the thorn out of a, a lion's palm comes which mm-hmm. you've probably heard in Bible studies, but it's from the gospel. It's not the gospel. I, bl- I believe it's the, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, um, which is a document we still have access to. Huh. But she was basically, Paul was like, get out of her way because she knows what's up and she's going to hang out and she's going to teach you some things. And mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing that she's not more well known. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was who was in charge and they decided, yep, women, nope, not going to be part of this thing. It's just weird. But yeah, Paul and Thecla was a very interesting thing for me because I've seen the statue. Like I went, I was in Turkey and I saw the statue of her and I was like, oh, I can't believe this survived. And they're like, well, the people around this area were really protectful of it because she was a woman who was in charge, who was in power. And those women were sure as hell not going to let that go away because then they could point to her all the time and say, what about Thecla? Right. Yeah. I've heard. Right. Like- I think I think there's been almost like, you know, Harley was saying, you know, decolonization. I think there's been an intentional erasing of women being in the church in the early church. Oh, I think sure. because, again, right. the patriarchy. Right. We don't they for whatever reason, women in power is very scary. So uh, women being equal is kind of scary. So um, well, think about it this way: until 500 years ago, the Catholic Church was the only game in town, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How does their structure work? <laughs> All right. patriarchy. I mean, right. priests can't even get married; they're that scared of women. Right. right. I mean, the Roman Empire was a blessing and a curse to Christianity. I mean, Christianity it it wouldn't have, have thrived and grown like it did if it was for the Roman Empire. But at the same time, the Roman Empire was like. Hey, you guys, get together right. and make sense out of this, okay? Get right. together, get an agreement, make sense out of it. It was the guys that called in to do it. And so, you know, that's the challenge we, we, we live with today is we lost a lot of strong characters and people from the early church, uh, you know, the women and, and other leaders uh, that we we have lost and, and and we don't have all their stories so mm-hmm. it's very different to me for um a divine feminine kind of perspective it is so completely different like god as a mother god being a maternal figure 
so mm. different. And again, I think that's very intentional that there's an emphasis of, oh, well, God is a father. Um, that changes a lot of things. When you see God as a father, that's definitely more authoritarian. Um, uh, there's a lot more grace, in my opinion, with God as a mother. <laughs> um, that's a whole other conversation. But um, I, I, can, yeah. I had a really hard time with the Godfather figure because my father, with uh, growing up, was extremely a, was abusive an abusive relationship with my mother, and so when I didn't know how to handle that, and there was this, there was given fed to me the simple dichotomy of you're in or you're out, you know, and I needed comfort and some kind of feminine divine voice that wasn't present in the Bible. Two things happened. One is I started understanding the, the concept of Mary uh, as yeah. Um, and letting go of some of the crap I was told about idolatry and things like that and allowing and from South Texas, as you know, and you know, Texas, mm -hmm. that's, it's a huge element to that. And especially within Hispanic culture, because of the, there's a redeeming element of decolonization again. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is I realized that, that in the Jewish context, there's not a, a specific gender to God. It's, mm -hmm. it's constantly always talked back and forth and back and forth. And I think, you know, Josh bringing up, like when the Bible was written, part of that too is like what words did were were chosen, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we know that certain words were were intentionally picked, and obviously the male gender was chosen over a neutral gender um, in the Bible. And there's been, I'm sure that someone has went in and, and edited it for that purpose, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I've got a, most of the people I know in ministry, they never use the he. All the he's here are changed to, you know when God is revealed, you know, and letting that be wherever it falls on purpose, yeah. you know, but it takes a lot of un undoing, you know, I think I still, when I read through it, I'm like, it's just a bunch of he's and it's real hard to not, to not do that. But mm. That's well, true. I had the privilege of going to a Passover Seder um, that was, I don't even know why, I don't know who was behind this. I don't know why it happened, but it, I just know it did in my city. Um, where it was led by female rabbis and all of the pronouns were changed to she That's awesome. <laughs> and her. Um, it was the most mind blowing experience I've ever had. I was so uncomfortable, but joyously uncomfortable because mm, right. I've been conditioned <laughs> for he and him for God. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, right. it, I, it was so emotional. It was very an emotional experience for me to think of God mm. in a, in a, he, that in a, she, context. her. Yeah. Um, it really blew my mind. It, it was, it was life changing. Like from that point on, I just looked at the texts a lot differently. Um, just seeing these rabbis, awesome. I mean, also oh, female rabbis are to me amazing. Um, but yeah, it's very powerful. Honestly, pronouns are powerful. I think so. Oh, for, for sure. It, what I was going to say actually now makes me feel like a dick for saying this because of the beautiful story you just shared. But I have a Lakota Sioux uh, uh, acquaintance who said, anytime you gender God, you've already lost the point. You've already made it dangerous. And he was, mm -hmm. he was specifically meaning the male pronoun. Like when you mm -hmm. make God, a, you make it terrible. But I mean, he was just saying, if, if there is a God, whatever it is, is beyond gender. Right. And we, right. And, but, but you are totally right in thinking that mm -hmm. because it's been so heavily put on one gender for so long, where it's been him forever. Now having someone say she is liberating. Mm -hmm. it it felt like they were just deconstructing everything right the the whole she thing it was more just like the principle of it the fact that they had right. the balls to do it i was like someone's gonna come in here and they're gonna shut <laughs> this down <laughs> is this even okay <laughs> oh, wow, is that's this heavy. legal like what is <laughs> happening wow hey guys I'm, I'm gonna restart the meeting again everyone hold your thoughts we have to restart again Are you sitting outside your house, Scott? I am, and it got dark on me. Yeah, sure did. Where are you at, Scott? I'm outside my house. Oh, no, no, no. What city? Jackson, Tennessee. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yep. You're in Jackson, Tennessee? Yes, sir. How big is Jackson, Tennessee? 
Uh, it's a pit stop between Memphis and Nashville. So it's probably around 50, 60,000. Okay. So a decent size town. Yeah. Birthplace of Rockabilly. So nice. Blue suede shoes. You, you look like a, a vampire right now with the, the lights. There you go. Yeah. Or like a werewolf trying to get on something. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, for pulling away, man. I really glow. You know? <laughs> Ash, I'm going to um, say goodbye, everybody. I was kind of quiet tonight, but I appreciate the conversation so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for Thank joining, you. Rachel. Thanks, Bye, Rachel. Rachel. Thank you. It was good have to see you. Have a great week, everyone. Yeah, you, you too. too. You know, we were discussing uh, uh, gender in uh, dealing with our religion. And uh, I was talking with a group locally here, and we have a couple of youth leaders who are in a, kind of an intern program uh, with churches. And one, one of the, the guys was complaining about a textbook he had at Old Miss. And uh, the textbook was God's Phallus. And it was like, well, shoot, with a title like that, who can, I mean, who can resist not reading that? The and textbook was called God's Phallus? <laughs> God's phallus. And so the local uh, Union University professor, Baptist University professor, and I were like, what's this book again? And sure enough, we ordered a copy of it. And it's written. Yeah, I'm by, looking it up right now. Yeah. And so it's uh, uh, written by a, a, a Jewish scholar. And uh, he basically he talks about how the masculine identity that has been placed on God, how it has affected uh human masculinity uh because it has this conflict there uh between in like views of dominance uh wow. the the level of love uh within the judeo-christian faith uh that is requested um it, it runs into struggling uh with uh homoerotic tendencies in the mm. male you know, the male uh, followers uh, type deal and how they dealt with that and how they kind of had to feminize, in his view, feminize men in order to have that relationship with God. It was a pretty fascinating read once you got hmm. past all the Freud notes at the beginning. Once you got done with the Freud stuff, I mean, it, it started picking up. But huh. yeah, if you if you want to walk around with a book that gets people to raise their eyebrows at the title, that's <laughs> <a good one. laughs> I wonder what the other uh, pitches for the title were. I don't know. <laughs> the, but on the front of it is a head of a snake. I mean, I see it, I see oh it here on God. Amazon. Is it wearing That's a hoodie? Great. No. <laughs> that would have been even, no, oh, that would have been totally wrong, Caleb. Well, you know how like Amazon will try to sell you. Yeah, there it is. Amazon will try to sell you. Here's a t shirt with the cover of the book. They don't do that with this one, but it'd be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Buy the t shirt too. I have one more question to sort of be an asshole. Go for um, it. Have you guys heard of Ashra? Ashra, yeah, I sure. Have. Yes. Don't in ask. Me in the Old Testament? Yes. Book of Kings? So Ashra in the Book of Kings is suggested that was worshipped alongside Yahweh as his wife. Mm -hmm. so, right. Oh wow! Initially, Judaism had a male and female deity. Cool. But and, and it's it's funny because it actually ended up in the canonical Bible. It's in Kings. Yeah. Uh, but it's before Judaism was monotheistic, it was polytheistic, and then changed. Yeah. Um, I think that's one thing that I'm I've really keyed on in that I've done the last Bible study we did where we did the historicity of Jesus. We talked about that Judaism was never one thing; that it was always evolving. Just like Christianity is never has never been one thing; it's always been evolving, mm. and we're all part of that story, um, which I think is super interesting. Mm. And so that's why I'm interested in these groups and hanging out with you fine folks tonight and getting to know you a little bit and. It's, it's just fascinating to me because the story of what Christianity will be in our time hasn't been written yet. Mm. And we might be part of that story, this community of people who've come together who just want to make the world better, but we're also struggling with the detriment that our scriptures have brought to us. You know, like the queer community, for example, I have so many friends in the queer community. My, my brother-in-law and his husband, obviously you say that, like, 
are dear and near to me. So like that's a huge thing for me, but in the, the scripture specifically does say negative things about homosexuality. There's no real way around that other than to say, right. well, somebody tried to do something good and it just didn't happen. Yeah. Other than saying, well, scripture is true and everything's good. It's like, no, that, I can't do that. <laughs> mm. so, sorry, that was all I had to say. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, I love I, that. I mean, you know, um, I gotta, I'm sorry, you guys, I gotta get off here. I'm gonna go talk to Zoe. He's messaging me, so okay. I'm gonna. Hello, Zoe. Hello. I was super nice. Jump. Thank you love. so much, you guys. All right. Send our love to Zoe. See you. Very well. Bye. 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 And then there were four. <laughs> yeah, I hope Zoe's okay. Yeah. I think they're just in an emotional place. Yeah, I, I think it, it really helped me. It really helped me when I came to the realization that, and, and I got into a huge fight with my brother over this. He was like, you don't believe the Bible is divine. And I said, here is how the Bible came to be. And I listed all the steps that I could list. And I said, there is a message in there, but look at all the filters it went through. And you got to understand mm. the filters. That's a I really think, good way to put it. And I kind of came to the realization, you know, the Old Testament was written by troubled people, uh, mainly in a time where they were in disarray and they were trying to figure out what the fuck happened. Yeah. How did we screw up? And then the New Testament is trying to share this radical new idea that developed. And, the, mm. and throughout that whole story is the theme of man's relationship with God, you know, and how man understood its, rela its relationship with God. And you can see it as it evolves from the Old Testament into the New yeah. Testament. And then it's still evolving today. We're still trying to figure that out. Um, oh, yeah. But once that's, that's what once, we're fighting over. Exactly. And once I kind of mm. came to peace with that, so many more things opened up to me uh, within the Bible and those themes of struggles and those themes of success and, and love and hate and, and fears and, and uh, you know, resolutions, uh, you know, all these different themes started popping up once you kind of oh, look at it like that. Yeah. So mm. that's the biggest thing, you know. That, that helped me when it comes to, to studying these scriptures. Mm. Very well put. Where are you, Harley? I'm in Corpus Christi, Texas. Corpus Christi, so how, how are things going down there? Um, I don't think Texas is doing a very good job in general. Uh, that's just my opinion politically. But um, Corpus is testing like 20 or 30 people a day when they're swearing they're testing like a thousand people. and. Uh, you know, we're like bragging about how we have the least amount of COVID-19 things. My wife and I run a jewelry business and we uh, haven't been able to set up at shows and in some cases have chosen not to set up outside in shows that did want to have us. So moving everything online. What kind of business did you say? What's that? What kind of business did you say? It's a jewelry business. We hand make like uh, contemplative oh. jewelry, like malls jewelry. and things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so been tricky you know what i mean it's it's hard because it's a it's it's both a military town so we have a huge we have one of the larger bases here and it's a college town we have three colleges and so um getting college students to social distance is tricky when they all are just kind of like on the beach and super horny um <laughs> we're like constantly seeing like video of like the news out on the beach and it's just like thousands of cars you know so amanda and i are like we just want to go hang out for a minute like <laughs> Like just go by ourselves, sit there, and, and so it's been tricky. You know what I mean? But uh, you know, we're figuring it out. I think everybody's trying to do what they can do. So my brother's in the food industry as well here, and and uh, he's been kind of reassessing if that's the always thing for him uh, during this time because it's. I think we're all kind of re reassessing that sort of stuff. So mm. it's a horrible time to wrap up a degree. I'm like, oh, I'm going to grad school if they open. <laughs> so I, I graduated from seminary in 2008 when the economy collapsed. Oh yeah, you know what it's like. I, well, I well I just ended up being doing a service industry job uh, for years, 
And those kids who are doing the same thing now can't get any of those jobs. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just walk into a job where you can be like, well, I have a strong personality and I can do the service industry. Like, nope, good luck. Like it's tough right now. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. And it's going to get tougher. So like I work at food shelves. So like we're doing emergency curbside boxes to go and we're giving about 65 to 70 pounds of food to each individual that comes in. And wow. mm-hmm. our numbers are going up and like, it's yeah. just more and more people. And it, it's funny because people are coming now who drive Mercedes Benzes or drive Audis because right. they, they had high profile jobs and they lost them. And now they have no cash because they spent all their money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And or it's so, all tied up in bills that you were like, oh, sure. I don't even have that much debt, but I got to pay it off. Yeah, when oh, money's zero, it's if the bill doesn't not stop coming in. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, we have so many yeah. new folks coming in who are just like, I've never been to a food shop. How does it work? And and I've worked in food shops for the last like like six years, so it's is that similar to like what we would call down here like a food bank? Like you go in and yeah. you shoot proof of like income, maybe a electricity bill, and they put you on a list. That so, kind of thing. So for us, there's no requirements. Uh, you okay. come in, you want food, we give it to you. Good. That's wow. It. Doesn't matter where you live. Doesn't matter where you come from. You come in, and we used to have a grocery store. Available. You'd come in and pick your own groceries. But right now, we can't do that. So right, right now, it's emergency curbside boxes to go, and we try to throw as much stuff. As we can. That's awesome. Yeah, there's there was a few places, and I've lived in a, multiple places in Texas, and that would do that. But most of the time, you're having there's all kinds of weird things. There's some that require you to sit through a talk. There's some that right. require you to have all kinds of paperwork and things like that. So, so my organization is a secular organization. So we have as little barriers as possible. And that's, that's also awesome. that's also staying within um, state guidelines. Having said that, my organization started as a Catholic organization. And so mm-hmm. it moved from that. So it started as a Christ child society. Um, so it moved from Christianity to something else, which is similar to me where I I still find everything from the Christian story super valuable, but I've moved to something sure. else too. Hmm. Uh, that's I don't awesome. know what it is. I don't have a philosophy about that kind of stuff. Me and Caleb have talked about this a lot, um, but we're all trying to figure this out. Like our own deconstructions and reconstructions and figuring out what the Jesus story means to us that's still meaningful. Mm-hmm. But, also, yeah. but also we're trying to push away the things that were detrimental, the things that, that kind of crippled us right yeah it's it's mm-hmm. both it's totally. healing and trying to like articulate what's what's still true yeah that's hard to do at the same yeah. time and it's interesting too what popped in my head uh something that selena was saying earlier which i i fully agree with and at the same time fully agree with the opposite side as well um it's kind of just one of those one of those paradoxes i guess but like about like trying to you know, study hermeneutics so that you can read the text, you know, in the original context, in the original language, know where they're coming from, what the culture was like, and all that. But at the same time, you know, Picasso said a, a piece of art is worthless unless it has at least, I don't know what he said, like a hundred or a thousand meanings or whatever, you know, and like the whole point of postmodernism is finding different readings of texts, and if a text is good enough, then it has multiple meanings and multiple readings and you can always get something new out of it in a new context and i value both of those is what i'm saying and um and so i yeah i appreciate that that i have that fluidity now to where um i can like yeah that's a damn bummer if this was so othering when it was originally written um you know but at the same time just for whatever almost like therapeutic reasons uh finding a way for myself to be able to read it and stomach it Mm mm-hmm you know, by cherry picking, of course, and by choosing to sugarcoat certain things. Well, we all do. Yeah, you're not alone. No, and I'm not. I'm not apologetic about it either. You know, it's just it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, to me, like from a history perspective, it's really it is important to get like, but uh, like you mentioned, Josh. I mean, there's no primary sources here, I and mean, this is all replicated over and over again. I mean, this is right. not. We're not reading straight from the the horse's mouth, and and that's important. And and over time, something that's ancient is required to be understood within a new context. I mean, it's a meaning making. That's the goal of it. Like, of it. and everyone's looking at it. I can't look at it outside of my own context. I just can't. You know, there's um, we can't separate ourselves from that. 
if people like us stick around long enough, the sort of Christianity that we're interested in, the sort of fringe Christianity that um, is actually trying to do some good in the world and is actually like taking some flack for it and actually sacrificing to to do something good for other people that isn't for our own self-interest. Like there will never be a Josh Bow center for whatever because I will <laughs> never make enough money to do that. But right. Hopefully there will be a Josh Bow um, memorandum where people have said, this dude gave a shit enough about me, I will sign his eulogy. You know, right. something, something like that. Like, that's all I want. Maybe, maybe they can put up a bench for you. <laughs> I don't even need a bench, you know. It's just um, a, a, an open brick that can be thrown at certain things. I there basically like, want oh, an oh. old school um, uh, shit. Uh, yearbook that's just signed by people who are like, yeah, he helped me. That's fine. I signed Josh Bow's crack. Yes. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really great. Um, but I don't need a center or a place named after me. I just, I just want to know that I did as much as I fucking could, and I know I'm not. Um, but also, like, I don't have the resources to do whatever I want to do. So I position myself to do as much good as I can in my context. And that has to be good enough. Like, and, and yeah. it's probably not. Well, um, the, but, but like, see, so you're going back and forth between like, that's so weird to me because I think that's where the where we're set up at. We're set up to be like, I'm doing all these great things, but it's probably not enough because that's our old story, right? Our old story is you're not doing enough. You know, you're kind of like still on the cusp of good or bad or whatever. Oh, I don't, just, that's, I don't think that's true. You know, yeah, like yeah. I think I don't know you well enough to say what you're doing or not doing, but. Just give a shit and love as right. many people as you can. And like, fuck off after that yeah <laughs> like, i did for 13 years i did a i did an interfaith study group called the brewery and our tagline was giving a shit since 2008 because we basically came to the conclusion that if we can do that wherever we come at you know if you don't leave here with like the virgin birth or you believe in something completely anti you know anti uh, antithetical to what we're talking what most of us might be talking about from south texas which was 80 percent christian if you give a shit about each other here and you can give a shit about each other outside of here then, then we're, you know, we're doing well, you know. And so I, I lived in a commune called Das Community for about eight years, and our only rule was that we were deeply broken people committed to needing each other. That was it. Deeply cool. broken people committed to needing each other, and then we just said, "That's a rule." That was our only rule, like a rule of life, something like yeah. an observation, yeah, like a rule of life, like for a for a commune or a commune. monastic community. Yep, that was it. That was our rule. And um, it did some pretty great things and also failed spectacularly, you know? <laughs> well, if you're going to um, fail, fail spectacularly. Yeah, so, right? No. But it fell, <laughs> fell again, fell better, right? I just read a card, a friend of mine, Gina, she's like, she's just turned 73, I think, this year. And she was like, that's my goal, fail better. And she wrote it for me at the middle of one of the meetings and handed it to me afterwards. She goes, this is what I got out of the last two hours. We would meet for two hours in dialogue every Wednesday. And she said, I think failing better is the new goal for me. And I'm like, that's awesome. Because I think before it was like, don't fail. Don't fuck it up. And now uh, she's like, I'm going really, to fail well. You know, like. Wow. God, I have a question for you. Can I? Go ahead. Yeah. What's up? Um, you work within, within an institutional system. And I know that I, I'm really interested about Josh's like concept. And I, I agree like the fringe element too. Um, but I'm working on a discernment process within the Methodist tradition right now. Yeah. And it's an interesting context to say like, I want to tie myself kind of like tether myself into this larger uh, religious institution. while I know that my people are really on the fringe if, and probably not even on the inside of that. So how do you navigate? I mean, what's the navigation? That may be something you and I can talk about personally, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I fail better at that. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But you know, it's just uh, you know, sometimes you got to be the thorn in the side or the uh, try to generate a light bulb somewhere, and and sure. and and still love with all your heart the the congregation there, even though at the same time you're saying in the back of your mind, "What the fuck are you doing, man?" Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, it's it's one of those things. So yeah, I yeah, feel like that, that would be a good conversation to have sometime. Over a Let's beer. try to do that sometime. Yeah, a lot yeah. of digital beer. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I think Jay Jay Baker is is consistently in the last 
year or two been very focused on, hey, maybe maybe being out on the fringes have, has made us condemn the people that aren't in the fringes. Maybe those are our only right. people. And that's not cool. You know, like a Christ consciousness would redeem the, you know, the, the fucker and the fucked, you know, yeah. like to use the mm-hmm. Greek, you know. Um, <laughs> and, Pardon my Greek. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it will, you know, and I think that's part of my part of my interest in going into like a ordained sort of route right. and committing to an institution is like I think they need rede- they need to be told their loves too, and like yeah, yeah. without the without any of the like qualifiers, right? Like that didn't actually do anything for them. <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah, let's have that conversation sometime if you don't mind. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I had to follow that rule of, you know. God made us, you know, God made all of us. And, you know, we're supposed to have that mutual love among God's creation type deal. And it's, it's kind of hard as hell, you know? And it's like, definitely if, if somebody goes, well, I love all of God's creation. That's when I like, even the child molester and then it blows their mind. I'm like going, you know, I'm blowing a hole in your, in your theory here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's one of those things to where um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge for folks, you know, and it's, and it really, you know, it, it, you know, these ideas we have set up, you know, I'm one of those guys that I like lovingly want to punch a hole in it. If there's a, if it, it needs a hole punched into it. So. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that's why they don't invite me to meetings half the time. So that's why what <laughs> they don't invite me to meetings half the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not planning on being like fully accepted in the, in the group. You know, I don't know if I want to be. You know, <laughs> that's right. Right on. It's super nice to meet you. Um, I'd love to talk more. Um, even though we're all across the country, like it's. Um, it's just interesting to hear different things about, you know, what people are doing with Christianity now and figure it out. Um, Cause we're all those theologians now, I guess, who are making it our own and mm-hmm. work for us and helping people to help themselves. And like I've been dealing a lot with just people who have trauma about their and just trying to help them not throw everything away. And, and I don't mean that in like, I'm trying to defend Christianity. Um, right. Just, I want to validate their criticisms and let them know they're not alone and let them know that they have someone who I'm obviously not in the church, but um, who does a lot of things that are churchy. Like I work at churches five days a week. I'm at churches a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm there. And it's funny because you not being a believer um, I spend most of my time at church. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> it's weird is what it is. Um, but validating people's fears and letting them speak honestly and openly for someone who works in a church, it, for some reason, has has some value to them. And uh, I am ordained, and I went to seminary and have a master's degree, blah, blah, blah. Um, but... Um, people who are hate the church i can handle them like i can right so their anger and their their rage and if they just want to say fuck everything i'm like that's fine let's just talk that's okay Mm -hmm. um and so i i don't know maybe i should be a religious trauma therapist maybe sometime um i need some more training for that Uh, (laughs) but it's it's nice to be an open ear for folks who need some outlet that still has some sort of like priestly acknowledgement because I'm ordained, mm. you know. Sure. What's and, your tradition? So what I, was your tradition? I was raised Catholic. Okay. Um, but then I was ordained evangelical. Wow. Cool. So I That's went, a good mix there. Right. He yeah. became a six day creationist. Yeah. From yeah. Like Catholic. At, at, oh, funny. He did. Oh, so weird. Um, but like example, so uh, sorry, Josh. I love telling that story. Oh, that's funny. She's so funny so to me. Four, four years ago, <laughs> like 